Thank you to Brother Caleb for reading our scriptural text this morning, which came from the book of Acts. The chapter was 17, and the verses were 10 through 15. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, why nobility isn't normal why nobility isn't normal. There's three points I just want to bring to your attention this morning, and then the lesson would be yours to respond to. I want to begin with the narrative in Berea. Berea, we don't hear a lot about in Scripture. Our information about this region is limited to the six verses that we are reading in the book of Acts. But when we look at this narrative, it's a narrative that is highly quoted, often preached on because of how the physician Luke describes this group of people. In understanding the narrative in Acts chapter 17 about Berea, we recognize this as the second evangelistic journey of the Apostle Paul. We can read about his first journey in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. But now we're beginning to read that this narrative is in the midst of his second evangelistic journey, which ranges from Acts chapter 16 to Acts chapter 18. He starts this journey from Antioch in Syria with a man by the name of Silas. And as he begins to journey from Antioch in Syria, he picks up Timothy in a place called Lystra of Galatia. And then we learn when the language changes in the midst of chapter 16 that he picks up Luke in a place called Mysia. And from there, they preach the gospel in Philippi, and they preach the gospel in Thessalonica. In both places, churches were established and letters were eventually written. And it is from Thessalonica that the narrative picks up in Berea because after Paul leaves Thessalonica, he goes to a place called Berea. And so let's pick up our reading and our study in Acts chapter 17, verse 10. In Acts chapter 17, verse 10, the Bible reads, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. The Bible tells us here that these brothers were brothers and sisters. And the fact that these individuals were trying to preserve and protect the life of Paul and Silas, these would be individuals that had recently responded to the gospel message in Thessalonica. But we recognize the fact that the reason why Paul and Silas find their way in Berea is because of the response of the Jews that were in Thessalonica. The Bible tells us that the Jews in Thessalonica were jealous of Paul and Silas. So they were sent to Berea. And one of the things that we have to appreciate about Paul and Silas is that this narrative takes place after they had been beaten and arrested in Philippi. This narrative takes place after a group of individuals in Thessalonica were angry and jealous and were looking to do them harm. And yet the first thing they do when they get to Berea is to find a synagogue so they can proclaim the very same message that led to their beating, that led to their arrest, that led to their persecution, that led to the uproar that caused them to leave Thessalonica in the first place. In other words, they just can't shut up 
about Jesus. They have to keep talking about Christ and him crucified. So they find a synagogue and begin to proclaim Jesus. But then the verse that we love is Acts chapter 17, verse 11, because this is the verse that we quote. This is the verse that we talk about often. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible reads, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bible uses the term that these were more noble. It's not to suggest that these Bereans were just noble. They were more noble because even the Thessal Thessalonians that did respond to the gospel message, they were noble. But these Bereans were more noble than them. See, the response of the Bereans were different than the response of the Jews in Thessalonica. We want to read the response of the Jews in Thessalonica. We can read about that in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And we can compare how did these Jews respond to the message in the first nine verses versus how these other Jews responded to the same message in verses 10 through 15. One visit to the synagogue in Berea led the Jews to examine the scriptures. But in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, three visits to the synagogue in Thessalonica led some of the Jews and some of the Greeks to believe. But many in Thessalonica, unlike the Jews in Berea, were jealous and they caused an uproar and they falsely arrested a man for practicing hospitality towards Paul and Silas, and not only arrested Jason, but also newly converted Christians, and only set these men and women free when they paid a bribe or paid a fine to be set free. We then come to Acts chapter 17, verse 12. In Acts chapter 17, verse 12, the Bible reads, Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. From the preaching of Paul and Silas and from their own personal examination of what thus saith the Lord, many obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we come to Acts chapter 17, verse 13 where the Bible reads, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Imagine the scene here where the Bible shares with us that the Jews from Thessalonica left Thessalonica to come to Berea, to do in Berea what they had done in Thessalonica. And that was to agitate and stir up the crowd all because they learned that the word of God was proclaimed in Berea. How evil does an individual have to be that you have a preacher in your midst, you don't like that preacher, so you run that preacher off, and then when you find out that that preacher is somewhere else, you make it your resolve to abandon where you're at to go where he has gone to cause problems there when whatever he is doing over there is none of your business. Not only that, we come to Acts chapter 17, verse 14. 
In Acts chapter 17, verse 14, the Bible reads, Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to, to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. I wonder why only Paul was sent off. Because it was Paul and Silas and Timothy that are doing the work. Why is Paul sent off? Well, I believe that since Paul was the chief speaker, the brethren sent him away. And they sent him away by sea where Silas and Timothy were left behind. And I think that part of the reason why they were left behind is because the Jews in Berea was more noble than those in Thessalonica. So therefore, they have received the word. They are responding to the word. And therefore, these two preachers, one a prophet, the other a young preacher, are staying and working with this new group of Christians because they know that they're working with a group of people who are truly sincere, honest, religious, noble. And that brings us to Acts chapter 17, verse 15. Because in Acts chapter 17, verse 15, the Bible reads, those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. The Bible tells us that Paul was being led by these brethren and they decided to settle upon Athens as to where he was going to go. And so when pa Paul recognized and realized where he was going, once he got there, he sent word for Silas and Timothy to meet him there. That's the narrative of what it is that we are studying this morning. But now I want us to move on from the narrative in Berea to the nobility in Berea. We see the nobility in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Look at the verse again. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible reads, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. My brothers and sisters, the Bereans possessed three virtues that are essential to not only being saved, but also staying saved. We need these virtues to get into Christ. And once we practice and have exercised these virtues, we need to continue in these virtues to stay in Christ. You want to know why certain people fall away from Christ? It's because they abandon these virtues. You want to know why people never respond to the gospel call? because they never exercise these virtues. And these virtues are found in the three words that we're looking at on the screen right now, receive, examine, and daily. First, let's deal with the receive. The Bereans had an open heart. The Bereans had an open heart. We see this phrase, open heart, earlier on in this second evangelistic journey. When we take a look at Acts chapter 16, and the verse is 14. In Acts chapter 16, verse 14, look at what is said about Lydia. The Bible says, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And what did God do for her? The book says the Lord opened her heart. To what end? The Bible tells us to pay attention to what 
was said by Paul. The Bereans had the same open heart. There were so many people in Thessalonica that had closed their heart to the message of Paul that they didn't pay attention to what he was saying and therefore became jealous and agitated and caused an uproar, got mad, allowed themselves to be overtaken by rage. Why? Because they didn't have an open heart. They had a closed heart. They already believed what they believed and didn't want anybody to tell them anything different. But thank God for these Bereans. Thank God for people like Lydia who allow themselves to be used of God and say, I know what I know, but I don't know everything and I can only learn more when I hear what you know. And so therefore I will open my heart to at least pay attention to what you say. And when the information is sound, I will respond appropriately. And that's what we see in the text, the Bereans had an open heart. They received the word. And not only did they receive the word, they received it eagerly. They weren't like people today that when you quote scripture, they get mad. When you give them the word, they're not eager to receive it. You got people don't even read their Bible, but then want to tell you that they know their Bible and therefore they are turned off. Almost like the wicked witch of the West, that when you put water on them, they're melting, they're angry, they can't handle it. The very thing that is designed to help them and to keep them alive is the very thing that they are allowing to kill them because they don't want to hear it. We also see that not only did these Bereans have an open heart, but when we look at the word scripture or examining, if you will, the Bereans had an open Bible. They had an open Bible. Listen to your Bible as we go to Luke chapter 24, verse 32. Listen to the testimony of the disciples on the road to Emmaus when they met the resurrected Christ but didn't know it was the resurrected Christ until after the resurrected Christ departed from them. In Luke chapter 24, and the verse is 32, the Bible reads, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us? the scriptures. I say open Bible in this text is because we have Bible today. We have the 66 books. We have the 39 books in the Old Testament, the 27 in the New, the 1,189 chapters, the 31,102 verses that make up this holy writ that makes up the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, the basic instructions before leaving earth we have a bible and the bible does us no good if we don't open it and so we have to open the bible but in this text they didn't have the complete bible but they did have the scripture and the scriptures are contained in the Bible. And so what these Bereans did is that they opened the scriptures that they had and examined them. They examined the scriptures to see, which means that they didn't take anybody's word for it. One of the things that we're always encouraged here is that you check behind every preacher, including this preacher, as to whether the things that are being taught and said are so. You don't get to do this anywhere else in Tucson because men that stand in this position get offended if you open your Bible 
No, they want you to still be in a millennia of a dark age in which you are ignorant of the scriptures. They want you to take their word for it. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. And the only way you can take God's word for it is if you have God's word and you open God's word and you read God's word and you examine God's word. Not only that, my friends, we see that these Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica because the Bereans not only had an open heart, not only did they have an open Bible, but they had an open schedule. See, they made time. They made time to study. And not only did they make time to study, they made time to study daily. That's the word daily in that text. They did it every day. The only way we can be blessed is if we do it every day. And this is not just a New Testament concept that made these Bereans more noble, but hear the words of the psalmist in Psalm verses chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2. Listen to what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, blessed, happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law, he does what? He meditates. How often? Day and night. You know, one of the things I tell Sister Angela is that, you know what? I've been with you for 24 years, but I only think of you on two occasions. (laughs) And that's day and night. Amen, somebody. And so this is the response to the people with the word. They are examining these scriptures. Daily, God's word is always on their mind because they love God's word. They know that through God's word, they are blessed. We know that through God's word, it keeps them from the counsel of the wicked, the way of sinners and the seat of the scoffer. And if we want to be sent away from the way of the the counsel of the wicked, the way of sinners and the seat of the scoffer, guess what we must be doing? We must be examining the scriptures every day, daily, because this is not only what's going to make us noble, it will make us more noble. See, one of the things that I appreciate about the spirit of the Bereans is that they had the right perspective of good enough. See, they knew that good wasn't good enough if it can be better. And they understood that better isn't good enough if it can be the best. What happens if everybody in this congregation goes from being noble to more noble? You're here this morning, that's noble. But I wonder what more noble looks like. You pray, that's noble. But I wonder what more noble looks like. You talk to somebody about Christ, that's noble. But what does more noble look like? You're attending, you're worshiping, you're paying attention, that's great, that's noble. But what does more noble look like? Let's conclude by going from the nobility in Berea to the non-appearance in Berea. There were some things that were present in Thessalonica that were not present in Berea. And it's going to answer the question, why isn't nobility normal? See, when we look at nobility, that word simply means excellence. It means dignified. And when we look at the word normal, normal is designed to mean it happens all the time. It's consistent. 
It's what it's always been, which means that it's not always excellent. It's not always dignified. But when we understand what nobility means, we have to ask the question, why isn't nobility normal? If nobility means extraordinary and normal means ordinary, why isn't the extraordinary ordinary? And so if salvation, my friends, is man's greatest need, then why wouldn't a person open their heart to receive the word, open their Bible to examine the word and open their schedule to study the word? Well, there are five vices that are present among many people today that was absent among the Bereans in the text. The first vice that keeps people from being noble and more noble is the fact that people are distracted. People are distracted. Look at your Bible in Psalm 119, verse 37. In Psalm 119, And the verse is 37. The Bible reads, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. The reason why people are not noble is because their eyes are fixed on worthless things. They're distracted. They're distracted by the media. They're distracted by social media, they're distracted by television, they're distracted by entertainment, they're distracted by all these things that don't matter. And that's why they can never open their heart and open their Bible and open their schedule to receive with meekness this implanted word which is able to save their souls. They're so focused on other ideas and other philosophies and other areas of academia. They're so focused on books and things that the Bible qualifies as worthless. Not only that, we see that people are not only distracted, they are disillusioned. They are disillusioned. Listen to the words of Jesus as he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, because this is another reason why people don't open their heart, open their Bibles, and open their schedules. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, the Bible reads, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. In other words, they're disillusioned. They're seeing what's going on in other places that they don't feel it's necessary. They're so entertained and mesmerized by what's going on somewhere else that they become disillusioned. They are turned off, oftentimes by even how we respond when we are not endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. If people see us murmuring and complaining and fighting and talking about who's doing what and who's not doing what and and complaining and, and, and just backbiting and stuff like this, people are going to say, why even be with these folks if this is what it takes to be saved? I'm happy or lost. You know, the story is told of this family that was leaving worship services one morning and the father and the mother were in the front seat and they were just complaining about everything that went on. They said, oh, I can't believe we went to services this Sunday. We have to drive an hour to get out here and it looks like we just wasted our time. Oh, that preacher preached forever. Oh, and the song, I mean, can the song leader get the note right? He sung all these songs we didn't know. Clearly, Jesus wasn't there. I mean, that brother that prayed, I can pray the prayer right along with him. I knew what he was going to say before he said it. Did you see what sister so-and-so had on and what brother so-and-so had on? Who do they think they are? This is not the Kentucky Derby. This is supposed to be worship. I couldn't see anything with that hat she had on. And that deacon, oh, I'm saying, they're just 
just deacon in name. They don't serve. They do all, and they just complain and complain and complain. And the little boy was sitting in the back seat, and he said to his parents, he said, well, I didn't think the show was so bad for a dollar. You get out of worship, what you put into worship. And so we see that sometimes people are just disillusioned. And that's why they don't open their heart. That's why they don't open their Bibles. That's why they don't open their schedule. But not only that, they're dishonest. People are dishonest. There was a preacher in Texas by the name of Jack Evans, and he used to always say, you show me a man that obeys the gospel, and I'll show you an honest man. Because honest people respond to Jesus. Dishonest people do not respond to Jesus. Jesus becomes the litmus test separating the honest from the dishonest. Amen. Well, preacher, my mama hadn't obeyed the gospel. Are you trying to say she's dishonest? My mama really honest. Yeah, she may be honest, but she's honestly mistaken. She's on the wrong side. Your father is on the wrong side. Your kids are on the wrong side. If they haven't responded to Jesus, that makes them dishonest. When a person hears the word and don't respond to it, then they think they got more knowledge than Jesus. When a person hears the word but don't believe it, then they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. If a person knows that they're living in sin and refuse to repent of it, it means that they are lovers of iniquity more than lovers of Emmanuel. If a person knows that they need to pledge their allegiance to Christ by confessing his holy name and they refuse to do it, it's because they love crowds more than they love the Christ. And if a person refuses to be baptized and have their sins washed away, then that person is telling you that they prefer their status of sinner and reject the idea that they need to become a saint. That's dishonest. We need to start calling it what it is. We need to stop being so concerned with people's feelings. Why? Because God is going to hurt more than their feelings on the day of judgment if they're not right with him. And so we see in Romans chapter 10, verses 1, 2, and 3, why do you think Paul is yearning and praying for these Jews in Rome in Romans chapter 10, verses 1, 2, and 3? He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. It doesn't matter how zealous they are. If they're trying to establish their own righteousness and refuse to submit to the righteousness of God, they are dishonest. They are wedded to error no matter what. People are not only distracted, disillusioned, and dishonest, but another vice that keeps them from opening their hearts and opening their Bibles and opening their schedules to be more noble is that people are discouraged. People are discouraged. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12, as well as 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. We're running out of time, so I'm not going to read those verses, but I want us to understand from these two verses in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is that Solomon, before he gives his conclusion, he talks about how there's many books out there and how study is a weariness of the soul. And so when people realize that, yes, examining the scriptures is work, receiving the scriptures is work, doing it daily is work, they become discouraged and they become satisfied in their current position. And then oftentimes when you read a verse and you don't quite understand it, sometimes you get discouraged 
in which Peter says, yes, some of Paul's writings are hard to understand and they wrestle with his writings like they do the other scriptures. But then he gives the ta he gives the characteristic as to why they struggle with it because they are unlearned. And the only way the unlearned can become learned is by learning. Which means you have to open your heart. You have to open your Bible. You have to open your schedule. So that you can go from being unlearned to learn and go from discouraged to encouraged. And then we see that people are not only distracted, disillusioned, dishonest, and discouraged, but another reason why people don't open their heart and open their Bible and open their schedule is because they're disinterested. 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 Dis, 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 disinterested. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Oftentimes we become sluggish. We become lazy in our biblical responsibilities. And we forget who it is that we're ultimately supposed to be imitating. And that's Jesus Christ. But oftentimes we just run into a lot of people that just don't care. Why isn't nobility normal? Why isn't having an open heart, open Bible and open schedule normal? It's because people are distracted, disillusioned, dishonest, discouraged, and disinterested. So the question has to be asked this morning, where do you stand? Are you like the jealous Jews in Thessalonica? Or are you like the more noble Jews in Berea? Where do you stand? Are you going to leave this place not making a decision because you're agitated, you're angry because God's word penetrated your heart and called you out and is trying to cause you to make a move but through your stubbornness you refuse to move or are you going to be like the Bereans and you're going to open your heart and not only have you opened your heart you're going to leave this place if you haven't been persuaded already and you're going to examine the scriptures to see whether these things are so. And you're not just going to do it this afternoon, but you're going to do it tomorrow and the next day. Because the one thing I want people to do, that if you leave this place and you disagree with the words that have come out of my mouth, I invite you to study your Bible daily and come back next Sunday to prove me wrong. That's the discussion I want to have. As a matter of fact, not just me, but every Christian in this room that has a Berean-like spirit. If we're wrong, prove us wrong. If Jesus isn't the Christ, prove us wrong. If he isn't the great physician, prove us wrong. If he's not God's son, prove us wrong. If we're not supposed to live holy and consecrated lives, prove us wrong. If a person doesn't have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in order to be saved, come back and prove us wrong. If the Lord has more than just one church, prove us wrong. That's the challenge. And if you have the heart of the Bereans, I'm no prophet, but I will predict in your effort to prove us wrong, you will prove Christ right. 
and we will welcome you into the fellowship of this great church purchased by the blood of Jesus that is heaven bound, hell proof, Holy Ghost filled and founded on the rock that he is the son of the living God. But if you are a Christian this morning, if you are a member of the Lord's church and for some reason you have gone from nobility to that which is normal, that which is ordinary, you, for some reason, have allowed your heart to be closed. All of a sudden, your Bible is not as open as it used to be. As a matter of fact, you probably didn't even open it during this sermon. As a matter of fact, it's probably closed, and you can probably write with your fingers the word read me that will show up because the dust is still there. Maybe. You've allowed your schedule to become so busy that you say, I just don't have time to read God's word. I'm just so busy. I have too much going on. I don't have time to hear from the Lord, but then you expect God to listen to you in your time of need. When you want to talk to him in prayer, then this is your opportunity to make things right with the God who woke you up this morning for this moment before it's eternally and everlasting too late. Wherever you are this morning, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand.